Hello, this is Dion Wiggins. Uh, welcome to our webinar today, Applying New Advances in AI-Based Machine Translation to Real-World Use Cases. Uh, I'm joined by our Chief Scientist, Professor Philip Kuhn. Um, he'll be speaking uh, for the first part of this presentation today about a wide range of topics. He'll be covering deep learning, hype, uh, faster translation, bias models, document level translation, multilingual models, and paracrawl. Uh, I'll be jumping in at the end with a few case studies and a few other pieces that we can go over and uh, give you some real world examples, as well as um, some really interesting case studies from a few customers and a sneak peek of our July research, uh, release of Language Studio. So with that, I'm gonna hand things over to Philip. Yeah, thank you uh, yeah, uh, for joining this and I uh, hope you find uh, today's presentation useful. Let me start with uh, laying a little bit the broad uh, landscape of where new machine translation is right now. Um, there has been a resurgence of artificial intelligence research over the last decade or so, and the main driver these days is deep learning. So it's actually interesting that these are methods that go back to the 1980s or even 1960s, they had already like two peaks in their popularity. Uh, what's different now? I think one of the key differences is that we now have better hardware. Uh, we actually do run these models on GPUs that have thousands of threads of parallel processing uh, that enables also then newer and more complex architectures. So uh, just think about it, if we now have models with this, the hardware of today, uh, the train on several GPUs for several days. Uh, this is not something that was possible 10, 20 years ago. Uh, there have been some major breakthroughs. Uh, I think the whole thing that uh, kicked this off was uh, the success in image classification 2013. is something called ImageNet. And around 2016, it was applied also to machine translation and very quickly within a year or so became the new state of the art. Uh, they're also famous uh, uh, successes uh, in broader AI, like AlphaGo, which was the first computer Go player that was actually at the level or even beating the best human players. There's a lot of other things happening, deepfakes uh, or other generation tasks. Um, there's currently also a lot of hype around uh, uh, synthetic text generation and how uh, the capabilities and risks of that. It's actually quite interesting that machine translation is a leading driver for progress in uh, text processing. So it used to be we're borrowing techniques from everywhere. We often borrowed a lot of techniques on speech recognition, but now it seems that the models are being developed for machine translation then get adopted by the broader field of human language technology. Next slide. So to just to give a quick idea of what, what I mean when I talk about deep learning is um, it builds on machine learning where the idea is that you have a lot of examples of inputs and output pairs together. In the case of machine translation, that is pretty straightforward. You have a source sentence and a target sentence that you want to translate between. And the key to success is to have a good understanding of the problem and then do feature engineering. Next slide. Uh, with uh, neural learning, the big promise is that you don't have to worry about the feature engineering enough. The learning algorithm is uh, flexible enough to discover all relevant features from the inputs and the outputs. And uh, because uh, there, there are several steps of processing between the input and the output, it can learn automatically relevant features from the data. Next slide. Uh, deep learning is really just a neural learning as we have known it uh, since the 60s, uh, especially 80s, but now with more layers. So the deep comes from having deeper structures. You have more processing between the layers, and this allows more complex feature interactions. I think a good parallel to that is if you think about how a computer works, if a computer program can only consist of three lines of code, it's very limited what you can do. But if you have hundreds of lines of code, then you can do so much more. So there's much more complex interaction between the features and more complex uh, processing possible. Next slide. 
Um, another interesting thing about that, that deep learning and these neural network methods now became so popular across many different fields in uh, artificial intelligence is that we all use now very, very similar methodologies. It used to be that you do very different things. So image processing, you did like edge detections, and line detections, and shape detection, and image processing. In speech recognition, you did a lot of acoustic modeling, uh, sampling, text processing. We de dealt with things like uh, reordering and separation of words and morphology and robot control. You can tell a similar story. Now, a lot of these problems are really just converted into uh, a suitable representation of the input, a suitable representation of the output, but then the underlying technology behind it is very similar. So a key approach here is the encoder-decoder approach, where you separate encoding the input in a vector representation, so-called embeddings, and then generate the output from these vector representations. Um, I think that's a very clear way how this works in machine translation. So you try to represent the meaning of the sentence. So that's the encoder, and then you try to express the meaning of the sentence in the output language, that's the decoder. Natural language processing uh, is characterized by tasks that we call sequence-to-sequence -sequence problems. So we have a sequence of words. That's kind of the, the somewhat unique property of language. It's not like an image where you have like a lot of pixels or uh, any kind of classification problems in robotics where you know lift arm, move arm, uh, and maybe a continuous space. Uh, natural language is characterized by a sequence of discrete signals. So a sequence of words. I have a, you do, most of the natural language processing can be really characterized as a sequence of words coming in, a sequence of words coming out. And this might be summarization, question answering, um, anything really. In machine translation, it's a sequence of foreign words into a sequence of English words. Um, with uh, the advent of a new technology, there's always the uh, seem to be unavoidable hype around it, that whenever something new comes around, people feel like everything has been solved. Uh, so I made up this chart here, which is completely kind of not based on any empirical facts, but I think it still represents somewhat uh, what the popular press and general perception of a technology is over time versus the reality. And uh, machine translation is uh, well uh, experienced in going through these hype cycles. Uh, there was actually already in the 1960s, and you can find on YouTube interesting news reels about it, a so-called Georgetown experiment where electronic brains were very possible, able to translate from Russian to English and uh, a very confident pronouncement that the problem of translation is going to be solved in five years. And if you actually look at the, what they did was, you know, computers they were able to deal with maybe a few dozen row words and uh, three or four grammar rules. Um, we had similar hypes in, in the 80s with expert systems and fifth generation AI. Um, that's actually also a time where machine translation became somewhat a commercial product. Uh, Rule-based systems emerged that actually were used in a very limited way. Um, then statistical MT around 2000, which really then became uh, really popular in being used in actually practical uh, or utility to a lot of users. Um, then in the later years, we had a lot of concern about plateau and we're not really making any progress anymore. But now with the new MT, we have the latest hype. Um, so while this kind of hype and expectations kind of uh, roller coaster around a bit, the reality is that machine translation has become better over time and it has become more useful for more uh, use cases. Um, so gathering information on the internet about something that is only written in a foreign language is a reality. Uh, machine translation being used uh, in the context of the professional human translation industry is a reality. So we're actually at the point where it is quite useful, but it's definitely not solved. Right? So uh, you have to be a bit careful when you see pronouncements like this. Um, so one of the key terms currently being thrown around is uh, human parity. Are we as good as humans? And uh, uh, these things have even been claimed 
by, by companies like Microsoft, where they say uh, that uh, they can translate with the same accuracy as a human from Chinese to English. Next slide. Um, if you dig a little bit deeper into especially the technical reports is that uh, they compare, uh, when they make this claim that they're better than humans, that this is a comparison against crowdsourced non-professional translators. So if you just post your translation job on Amazon Turk, uh, the quality may actually be worse than machine translation, but then that's more uh, uh, indication of uh, that machine translation, the translation requires skill, um, it also requires dedication, and from a managerial point of view, it also requires some supervision and quality control. And uh, one thing that we definitely noticed by all these comparisons between machine translation and human translation is that quality control is a really important thing. And it's also not easy to do. And that's also something where maybe automatic metrics can make a bigger contribution than they have done so far. Okay, let me move now on to faster translation. So now I'm going to go over some technical aspects of machine translation that have been recently emerged that might be uh, of general interest. Uh, so we have already established that neural machine translation is the state of the art for now about five, six years. It is better, but one of the big drawbacks is that it requires a specialized hardware. Um, so even if you uh, just rely on consumer grade uh, NVIDIA uh, graphic cards that are really built for computer gamers, um, they cost $1,500. The actual data center grade uh, products from NVIDIA cost easily something like $15,000. So since this is a quite a, a, a quite a big expense, uh, one question is, can we get away with uh, just generally CPUs, at least for deployment, so when you actually have your translation system running and serving your translation jobs, can you get away without GPUs, without having all this expensive hardware? Next slide. Um, so one idea is, well, first of all, let's just build smaller models. So we know we can get the best performance with many layers of computation, kind of the key to deep learning, and very large embedding sizes, so very large representations um, of uh, um, in any kind of intermediate state or inputs and outputs. Um, you can clearly get faster computation if you have fewer layers, so if your computational stops, uh, steps and also small embedding sizes, so if you have numbers you have to operate on. Next slide. So one way to get there from big models to small models is to first train a really big model with everything you have. So have that invest in a training time, but then also add a training stage where you just remove parameters that are less relevant. Uh, so maybe some layers actually don't contribute much to the computation, um, you can actually look at you know weights that are close to zero or uh, just test what if you remove the layer, what does it do to performance? And uh, that way build a small model. Next slide. A more common technique, however, is uh, called model distillation. So this way you first train a big model and then take the predictions of the big model to train a smaller model. And you can do this in two different ways. One is data distillation, where you take the big model to translate the training data with that model. And, or the other one is model distillation, where you actually use the predictions of the big model to train the smaller model. So the smaller model just tries to imitate the big model's behavior. Um, so this is basically a setup where you build a smaller model that tries to imitate the big model as close as possible. So it's easier to train something that already works and uh, have a model that kind of imitates decisions of a big model that's already uh, proven uh, to, to actually be a representation of the translation problem and training it raw from data. And this is kind of the standard technique now to reduce the model sizes. Next slide. Um, then there's a lot of fine-grained things you can do too. Uh, one is how do you represent all the parameters? So there's a lot of floating point numbers in these models. Each basically parameter in the model is a floating point number. So the, the first step is to take these floating point numbers from 32-bit representation to 16-bit representation. But you can go even further 
and uh, quantize them into uh, integers. And so maybe just use 8-bit integers for something that previously used a 32-bit uh, floating point. Uh, the way this do this is to basically look at the distribution of the values and then quantize that into uh, some of representative ranges. Once you operate on integers, that also is much, much cheaper uh, in a CPU to, to, to use and uh, uh, operate on. Um, actually, if you look at the latest uh, Intel chips, they also allow you um, in CPU uh, vector operations by, um, since these are 32 bit machines, uh, then uh, 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 32 bit can be used to store eight, eight bit integers. And you can actually do parallel computation on 8-bit integers in one CPU cycle. Um, so all this allows us to do build uh, much faster and much more efficient models at uh, deployment time. Next slide. Um, let me do, take a, another topic, somewhat uh, quite different, uh, about bias in models. So this has recently become uh, quite interested interesting so we have a lot of problem with ai that learns from the data and therefore whatever bias and stereotypes or whatever exists in the data it seems to reinforce it so uh, here's a example of that that makes this a rather stark uh, characterization so you have here uh, the doctor asked the nurse to help her in the procedure so you have the doctor and the nurse uh, but you also have the pronoun her, and the her clearly refers to the doctor. So from this sentence, although doctor and nurse are not gender among English, it is actually clear that the doctor is female. So although it is actually semantically clear, even in the English, where gender is often not clearly marked, uh, and you have to translate that into Spanish, where gender is marked, it, even here when the actual the, the answer is given in the English, it made the mistake by just kind of having stereotypical translation of doctor as a male person and nurse as a female person. That is just a strong bias on the model. It's just seen el doctor so much more than la doctora, and therefore it's just going to use that no matter what. And uh, it would have would need really strong pushing to overturn that inherent bias that is in the data. Next slide. Um, there's all kinds of uh, language style biases beyond that, the way things sound and the way things are expressed. Uh, so here's a paper with a funny title, you sound just like my father, commercial machine translation systems include stylistic biases. Uh, because the training data we have are often from formal announcements, they're often written by people who are older, and therefore the models kind of pick up uh, the style and word choices and uh, language use patterns from the data and convert everything into that kind of representation. So even if you translate um, text that is written by very, very different demographics, the output might just uh, reproduce the style of what the data is in. Next slide. So when you translate, you, however, you want to obviously be as uh, 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 produce output that is preserves as much the style of the input as possible and also uh, makes the right decisions in terms of gender and age and sentiment and so on. So uh, we need to preserve language style and this is increasingly becoming a concern uh, that we have faithful translations and not just you know raw semantically accurate translations. Um, what you have to do here in terms of methodology is quite similar to domain adaptation um while well, we'll come back to that later uh trans things uh, translate quite differently once you know about which domain uh, they're being mentioned um, the style is uh, also um, quite different based on uh, which general context things are being translated and the methods are going to be quite similar there however it's it's much harder to get corpora that are marked for things like reading level or level of formality and gender and you'd only have like proxy representations of that so this is still a very open uh, research challenge next slide um, so another example of that is uh, dialectical language 
So since the data comes from one particular source, a representation of a language, uh, that's the language that it produces and that the language it does really well with. But even if you look at English, um, which exists both as a kind of a dominant language of fairly populous countries like the United States and Britain and other countries, um, it also exists in a lot of local dialects that differ from each other. So the models are often only trained on a standard language, uh, either US or British announcements, and they work well, less well with other dialects. So this is a problem for our machine translation, not so much for English and for others. It becomes actually a much more clearer problem if you look at how automatic speech recognition works with all these different dialects, because the spoken variants of English differ much more than the written variants, although the picture is quite different for other languages. Next slide. Um, so one thing, one area where we see these differences become much more uh, bigger and a much bigger problem is uh, the example of Arabic. Um, there's actually something called modern standard Arabic that is the formal kind of correct Arabic that is mirrors very cl closely the Quran. However, that is not really a spoken language anywhere. The different regions where Arabic is spoken, uh, it actually diverges quite a lot from that. Um, while there's a proper formal way of writing the modern standard Arabic and some publications follow that, a lot of other publications, especially social media and kind of more spoken news broadcast based media, uh, use language much more close to the dialect. And that has actually a huge impact on machine translation quality. Next slide. Um, so besides kind of these formal definitions of dialect, there's also something called social act, where people just communicate differently based on the education level, uh, based on the level of formality. Uh, maybe there are subcultures where certain jargon terms and slangs are being used, social groups, and so on. Uh, however, machine translation models are typically only trained on formal standard language, and you have then lower quality in other conditions. Next slide. So I found this a useful kind of guiding principle from an engineering perspective uh, to keep in mind that yes, we want to do the best in uh, our machine translation performance and we usually measure that as a blue score on a test set. And that's the number we go by and that's the number we report. Uh, and obviously this should be as representative of our use case as possible. But if the use of our machine translation is very broad and it's also used in many other contexts, uh, you also need to be aware of that. So one way of an engineering way of handling with that is uh, to also have test sets for different language varieties. And uh, obviously, if we, from all I said, it should be clear that then the performance on these varieties is going to be worse. But uh, there may be only a certain acceptable degradation on important language varieties. And uh, that's something we could measure. And if the performance then drifts off really badly, for instance, if our machine translation system works really bad on teenagers on Twitter talking about, you know, uh, Korean pop stars, and it just you know, everything gets mangled, that's something we should at least be aware of, measure with, and maybe if it is actually much worse than what we would find acceptable, properly address. Um, while still keeping kind of the headline performance in mind. Okay, next slide. Um, here's, for instance, one a solution that Google has to, to deal with these kind of uh, bias problems. So if you have a sentence, the doctor said, take the pill. Um, the English is actually ambiguous. It could be a male or female doctor. Uh, so Google Translate actually gives you then the options of uh, keep showing you both of these solutions. So this is something that obviously works and the constraints of a web interface of translating a single sentence, it's obviously it's going to be much harder to kind of uh, have this uh, ambiguity preservation in, in many other use cases where you just have a long story and you can't just constantly give alternatives for things because it completely breaks then uh, the ability to read and understand uh, this context. But it's, uh, it's at least an attempt of a solution and it's something um, we need to explore a bit more in the future. Okay. Next slide. 
Let me talk now about a couple of other things uh, in machine translation that have emerged recently in research. So one is document level translation. So a document uh, is multiple sentences. Machine translation up until now still is dominantly uh, on a per sentence basis. We, we, we just translate sentences by isolation. That's, some, that's a decision we've done taken a long time ago when it was already when it was still really really hard to even get single sentences right now we often get single sentences right but uh, we're not doing very well with document context so there's a bit of a movement to move towards document level translation i give you one example here the shop is selling a nice table jane is quite taken by it the table would match the chairs in her living room so uh, if you just translate sentences by time once one by one uh, you might actually do worse uh, than document level, uh, considering the entire document. And I'm going to explain this on this example in a bit more detail on the next slides. So we have here the translation of pronoun it, uh, especially if you translate into uh, languages with gendered nouns, you need to know what it refers to, and that it refers to table might uh, cause a different translation than it referring to other nouns. So that's something that often happens across sentences, although it might also happen within sentences. Next. Um, then you have a bunch of words here, table, chair, living room. Um, there, some of them are ambiguous. Um, table could be also like a tabular representation of information. A chair might also be a kind of a, a president or presiding officer or a kind of leader in a certain area, uh, but having table, chairs, and living room all in the same document makes it very clear we talk about furniture and all these references about the furniture meaning of these words. Next slide. Um, another thing that occurs in documents is that uh, you might have a word repeated, like table, and even if there would be two equally possible fine translations for them, uh, a document should be consistent in how to use them. Uh, to give you a bit more uh, illustrative example of English, you have words like freedom and liberty that are pretty synonymous. There's very subtle differences in meaning between them. But if your document in the source language had a consistent word for it, then the English translation should also consistently use either freedom or liberty, I'll switch between them because that might confuse the reader by saying when you now talk about freedom, but previously you talked about liberty, you actually mean something different. When actually the source didn't mean anything different by uh, these concepts. Okay, next slide. So um, the solution to that obviously is when you make the predictions, if you translate a new sentence, that you take the entire context into account that you don't only condition on the sentence that you currently translate, but you also condition on the previous sentences. Next slide. Uh, but you also should condition on all the previous translations you have made. So since you already make certain translation decisions uh, in the previous sentences, they, they, those decisions uh, will also influence uh, uh, our next decision. So this is independent from um, the source context. To, to give you one example, kind of what I said, like uh, the broader context helps to disambiguate the meaning of words like table, that is purely source context dependent. But when it comes to how to translate pronouns, so here, for instance, where it had to be translated into a pronoun in German, and the decision was made to, to translate it as er, because that's the male pronoun, because table, tisch in German, is um, has a masculine gender. So you have to condition also on the previous translations you made. Next slide. There are several uh, methods that have been proposed. So one is this idea of hierarchical attention. Obviously, if, if you have to take all these things into consideration, that becomes quite expansive. And uh, maybe the, the model gets then very easily confused. So the idea is to just kind of first weigh uh, which sentences should be pay, made, paid special attention to when making word predictions, and then which words within sentences should be sp paid special attention to. So this is called hierarchical attention. Next slide. 
a simpler solution is to just concatenate all these sentences together. So instead of um, presenting a sentence at a time, now we're trans presenting paragraphs or other fragments of documents at a time. Obviously, this stretches a bit the abilities of uh, machine translation models to deal with really long sequences and not get confused and maybe even drop their sentences. So this is a, a required a bit better uh, scaling of the neural coding implementations and the training of these kind of models on very large contexts. Um, there, there are between these two extremes that I showed, which one is just simple concatenation, the other one uh, more complicated attention techniques. There's also various uh, in-between measures to deal with that. Okay, next topic. Uh, let me talk about multimodal models. Um, what I mean by that is that uh, translation now also exists in a very broad multimedia environment. We're translating video, uh, movie subtitles, or even spoken language, and so on, Twitter messages, uh, text messages, uh, live communication, for instance, in a panel discussion. Um, so all that is now uh, in areas where machine translation is moving into. It's not just static, here's a document that's translated, it's fine you have the translation the next day. It it's lives in a much more dynamic environment and it is surrounded by other sources of media like video and audio. Next slide. Um, so one uh, thing, uh, one topic here in this area that already got the attention of people a long time ago was uh, image caption translation with the idea that we did really well with newer methods on image for image processing and then we moved on to text processing. So uh, since they both use very similar uh, technologies, it was pretty straightforward to the idea of just combining this. So here's an example. If you have the sentence, the bat was flying through the air, or well, bat is ambiguous, it could be an animal, it could be uh, a sport instrument. Um, it's actually not quite clear. Probably since we're talking about flying in the air, you might be tempted to translate it as the animal here. But if this is uh, accompanied by this picture here, then it's clear uh, that the, what we're talking about is the baseball bat uh, that is here being thrown through the air. So the image actually would help here uh, quite clearly to figure out what the correct meaning of this is and uh, translate the sentence in the correct way. Next slide. So the solution then uh, to deal with this kind of stuff is to both have an input sentence representation of the sentence, but also have an image representation of uh, the image. And both of these then play a role in predicting the output word um, alongside all the previous words in the sentence that already were generated by the model. Um, so uh, the green and the orange boxes are the things that were in the traditional models. Now we add to it this blue box of image representation. And uh, this uh, allows us then to have better disambiguation and uh, have better translation performance. Next. Another hot topic right now in the space is speech translation. So the move towards directly translate spoken context. So it would be nice to have this uh, uh, webinar, for instance, where I speak here uh, live and uh, maybe there are some people who might be interested in this content, but they don't speak English and they would like to listen to it in, in French, German, uh, Thai, any language you imagine. Um, so there have been advances in all these relevant technologies, speech recognition, machine translation, speech synthesis, and there are very similar methods for all these. Next slide. So a very straightforward idea is to then just concatenate all these technologies. So you take the input audio, run it through speech recognition, that gives us the input text, you run that then through machine translation that gives you output text, and you run that then through uh, speech synthesis, and that gives you the output audio. Uh, this is called a cascade model, and it's probably the most straightforward thing you can uh, think of. Uh, you just basically tie these technologies together. However, each of these technologies uh, is imperfect and makes mistakes, and you have an accumulation of mistakes throughout this pipeline. 
So there's a very strong move right now to build end-to-end -end speech translation systems. So these are models that are literally trained on audio in the input language, audio in the output language, and nothing else really giving in between. So this is kind of the grand vision of end-to-end -end speech translation. Technically, it gets a bit more complicated because you have very little data where you actually have input audio paired with output audio, but you have a lot of data for part of this pipeline. So training show is going to take uh, all these different types of data into account and has to get a bit more complicated. So this is still a, a challenging and kind of at the verge of becoming practical uh, field. And I think it's, it's going to be exciting to see how that works out in the future. Next slide. Um, one more comment to this is, uh, this is an additional challenge of simultaneous translation. So especially in a webinar like this, you don't want to wait until I finish my entire webinar to get uh, the translation. You want to have the translation as soon as possible. So you want to start processing while the audio is still being produced, while the, the, the original input is still being set. Each of the processing steps adds some de delays. And there's all, all the additional problem of delays by, for instance, uh, machine translation where a reordering takes place and just relevant words that really are important to just integrate the meaning or put things in the right order uh, come later. Okay, uh, let's move on to uh, collecting more data. Uh, this is a bit of an update of our efforts uh, um, on the Paracall project. So um, we're talking here about web crawled Paracorpora. Uh, so this is the main source of all the Paracall data we use right now, which is pre-existing translations. And uh, historically, these have been collected from big stashes of data from large multilingual organizations like the Canadian Parliament, with the Canadian Hansards, the European Parliament, United Nations. Uh, but clearly there are much more uh, translations available on the web, but there are also millions of websites. Uh, they have much more diverse content, diverse formats, diverse degrees of quality, but we would like to get as much of that data and convert it into a useful format for machine translation training. Next slide. So since 2006, uh, we've been working on a project called Paracrawl, where we basically make a publicly available crawl um, and distill crawl into parallel data of the web. This is funded by the European Union and involves several universities and companies, including Omniscient Technology. There have been public data releases and even open source code releases. So you can actually run this stuff yourself um, on whatever specific language pair, for instance, or specific domain you might be specifically interested in. It is, I have to say, uh, while, while the code is available, it is computational quite expensive, so it's not a trivial thing to do. Um, just to give you some idea about what we have to deal with there, there are various data formats like HTML with various wacky markup, PDF, which is really a format for communicating to a printer, not to a human reader. Uh, so you have to disentangle a lot of the formatting in there. Um, we developed a bunch of novel methods. A big focus was noise filtering because we realized, yes, these data sources are quite noisy, but we also realized that noise is a real problem for neural machine translation training. So noise filtering became a pretty big topic um, in, in recent years. Uh, sentence alignment, document alignment, focused crawling, um, and uh, all this took place during the revolution towards neural models. So the idea is then also to kind of convert all these methods we previously used that were very statistics based to more neural models. Next slide. So here's uh, just a bit of a uh, summary statistic on the latest release, which just came out uh, a couple of months ago. And uh, it's gotten pretty massive. The billion words was always kind of the magic size for a really, really large corpus. And we now have over a billion words for Dutch, French, English, German, Italian, Portuguese, and Spanish. Uh, the biggest corpus is a Spanish corpus with over 5 billion words. And this is, I have to say, the clean corpus. There's actually also a raw corpus you can download that is massively bigger, but it also obviously is very, very noisy. But you might have better filtering techniques than the ones we use, or you might have better ideas about filtering techniques. 
And uh, so you might also want to look at that. Um, we have now over 100 million word corpora for almost all the languages we deal with. Even for fairly low resource languages like Maltese and Irish, we have substantial corpora. So these are about the size of kind of European Union corporas. We also um, uh, have special releases for non-European languages um, due to various projects that partners were involved with. Although I think this is a bit the future of kind of these crawling efforts. Um, we have now these massive sizes of data, but we don't really have much for kind of the next 100 languages we might be interested in building machine translation systems for. Next slide. Um, let me talk a bit about multilingual models. This is another trend and it kind of fits into this whole data situation. So we train typically systems on parallel corpora where you have the text and source language paired with the text and luggage language and you train that. And uh, uh, that works pretty well if you have lots of data, but uh, for low resource languages, so not the top 550, but the next 50 or the next 100 languages, this becomes much trickier because you have very little par parallel data for those. Next slide. Um, so here's a um, very interesting kind of slide uh, from Google. I think this is now already like a year, a year and a half old about that reveals a bit what, what data sizes they work with and machine translation performance they get out of this. And uh, so in gray, you see the size of the corpora and you see the biggest, and it's sorted by size, and this is for 100 language pairs, and you see the biggest uh, corpora, uh, they have a billion word corpora, as we also just mentioned in this paracrawl. Um, but for the lowest, uh, lowest resource languages, they have barely a million words of data, maybe even less than a million words of data. And you look at the last dip there. And that has a clear impact on translation performance. So you, you do much better if you have much data. And here, the way they measure translation quality, you see kind of translation quality also drift off. Um, so uh, that's a problem for the low resource languages. Next slide. OK, so what do we do? We train. Um, uh, one idea is to just throw all this data together and train a system on all these languages together. So you join train a model on all these languages. So you have then a multi-language system that can translate at the same time German, Spanish, French, Dutch, or the same model into English. So you pool all this training data. And the hope is that you also learn something from uh, the different languages that can be used for other languages, like general translation principles, or even shared vocabulary of words like computer, or other kind of long words that make it across many languages. And it's also from a deployment perspective, a nice thing that you only have then one system to maintain for, in case, four languages instead of four different systems. And uh, so you can more efficiently use your compute resources. Next slide. Um, so here's a slide that shows, uh, again from Google, that uh, uh, this works really well, especially for the low resource languages. Um, so there's a bunch of curves here. If you just look at the blue curve, which is probably the most honest curve, which says, yes, you see some degradation on the high resource languages and then uh, improvements uh, in the low resource languages. So the low resource languages benefit from having data available in high resource languages. There might be some really related languages in there that you have a lot of resource. Uh, think about Russian, you have a lot of data in Russian, but you don't have a lot of data in Belarusian or Ukrainian or other related languages. Um, slide also shows that you can actually get a no degradation on uh, language on the high resource language pairs and just build really really large models. Of course, a 15 billion parameter models becomes then computationally uh, much harder to to deal with, especially at training time, but also at deployment time. Next slide. Okay, um, let me talk about one more thing, which is data synthesis. So yes, there's very very large amounts of data available. But in a way, you can never have enough data, especially you can never have enough data in specific domains that you care about. So it's good to get like paracrawl and you have like random web content, which might be a lot of hotel descriptions, but that might not be very useful for your particular use case. So um, what can you do? You can create additional data. Um, one of these techniques is back translation. So this idea of taking monolingual text in a target language, which might be then in the right language, 
in the right domain and the right style, all these good things. And but you only have it as monolingual data, so how can we uh, turn that into parallel data? Well, you train a system in the reverse direction that translates from the target language into the source language, and then uh, use this to produce additional data. Um, that's the thing at the bottom then, and then you combine the two things to train your final system. Um, okay, uh, next slide. There's also various other ways to do uh, data synthesis. So these are various techniques uh, that we have developed over the years. Uh, one is uh, paraphrasing. Uh, we have the sentence like, I bought my flowers, and then you know, replace with flowers with a lot of synonyms, or at least closely related words. Um, you can also do all kinds of grammatical restructuring to get more diverse representation of the sentence. There's been a lot of progress recently in automatic paraphrasing. Uh, that are very good at meaning preserving and gives you a different rep representation of the sentence. And we've shown again, benefits of kind of get a, get better performance, uh, especially in low resource sets, or if you have very little data in kind of client in domain data, and then increase the size of this data by a factor of 10 or 100. Next slide. So uh, that opens up uh, finally then the big problem of the main specific model. So I already talked about, yes, we have now a lot of data, uh, but we want to build specialized models in specific domains. Uh, we might not have enough domain models, so maybe um, data synthesis is the answer to that. But you still have the problem that you have a lot of data in general domain and very little, relatively very little data in your target domain. Next slide. So um, I'm, I'm pretty much just <laughs> talked about all this. So we have large volumes of data in general domain. You need to do well on this. So one standard technique is uh, uh, continued training, where you first train a general model on all the data, and then at a second training stage, where you just train on your in-domain mo model. Um, you have to be a bit careful about this. Uh, there's something called catastrophic forgetting, where you might look forget all the good things you learned from the general domain model and then just overfit on the in-domain data. So you have to look out for that. So you have to be careful in your training techniques when you deal with that. Next slide. Um, another thing you might want to do is have a model that is suitable for many different domains and uh, um, then build specialized models for all the different domains. So if you have sports, finance, law, and IT, you want to then build uh, separate models for that. And then at test time, you could take a sentence here, for instance, uh, a sport sentence, and just realize, yes, it should be translated with a sport engine, and maybe also to some degree a little bit. Uh, the other models can contribute to that. So you do some weighting between these models. So the idea is to have a multi-domain model that can be used for many different things. Um, a simpler version of that is the idea of using domain tags. So if you look at this, uh, these examples here, these are sentences from different domains. And we don't only present uh, the text of the sentences to the model. We also present the, uh, an additional tag, which is just another token we add to the input uh, that gives away what the domain that is. So this is something that the model is exposed to at training time. And then it's also, as he sees it, at test time, so the model learns automatically uh, how these special tokens uh, should be weighted during word predictions uh, that actually happen at, at runtime. Next slide. Okay, so thank you, Philip. So we've got some very interesting features that Philip's just run through. Um, we're going to now move on to actually seeing some of those with real world customers and real world case studies. So this is the second part of our presentation today. Um, if you have any questions for Philip or myself, please don't hesitate to put them into the question box and we'll, we'll do our best to answer them at the end of the presentation part. Um, this part will be reasonably fast. We're just going to show a few case studies. We're going to show the process of how we build some of the things that Philip just talked about. Um, we're going to show some real world um, document mode and multilingual model examples. And then a very quick preview, sneak preview of uh, Language Studio 6, which ships next month. Okay, so first of all, um, when we talk about Google and Deepool and uh, Bing and many of these other engines, 
um, they have a different goal than what we're trying to do for our customers in most cases. So generic engines like Google, uh, they have a goal to translate anything, anywhere, anytime for anyone for the purpose of understanding. They don't give you the ability um, without doing customization, and some of them don't support customization, some do to some degree, um, in order to make it a particular writing style. So when we produce the translation, we've customized the engine and the goal is actually quite different. The goal is to have an output that requires the least amount of human effort in order to publish. So the quality bar is very different. So in order to do that, you need data. And one thing we tell all of our customers is you don't have enough data. It doesn't matter how big you are. You could be as big as IBM or anyone else for that matter, even as big as Google you will never have enough data. Other data is always needed to fit your use case. Okay, and it's gotta be the right data. So I like this analogy. This analogy here is uh, when you're stuck in traffic, um, you're not actually stuck in traffic, you are traffic. Okay, and if we wanna eliminate traffic, then we need intelligence. And the data on the traffic is as important as the actual traffic to solving the problem. So that's where everything comes in here is getting the right data. So Philip talked about uh, Paracrawl and various other sources, and we have Paracrawl amongst many other things in our repository. And we draw on bilingual sentences in the repository and we pull down and we extract specific data. So we have, uh, when we build an engine, we have language pair foundation data, and that's anywhere from 20 to 100 million sentences. We have industry specific data, uh, that's 20 to 40 million sentences typically. Uh, clients usually give us data. A small client may give us as little as nothing, um, or they may give us 100 or 500K sentences. And then we actually synthesize and manufacture sometimes 20 to 40 million, sometimes even more sentences to build an engine. So there's a lot of data going in and there's a lot of data being created and selected. Um, so before we go deeper into that, I'm going to show you some results from customers' engines. I've, I've picked a handful of engines that we've produced over the last two weeks. Um, and I'm just, I'm not going to announce who the customer is, but I'm going to show you the measurement results from the customer and talk a little bit about their language pairs and domains. Now, all of these measurements were done on 100% blind test sets with at least 1,000 sentences so that they're statistically relevant. And I want to stress something here. This is not one-off lucky results. This is a finely tuned, repeatable process, and I'll be showing you that process here. Okay, so first of all, this was an engine we delivered earlier this week to a customer. It's a difficult language pair and a difficult domain. The language pair is French, Japanese, direct, no pivoting via English, and Japanese, French, coming back the other way. Okay, so the top example is Japanese to French. We got a blue score of 60. Um, compare that to Bing. Um, and Google and Deeple. So Google got 38, Bing got 32, and Deeple got 35. Um, going the other direction, we got a 44. Um, Google got 34, Bing 29, and Deeple 30. Now, this is not an easy domain. This is nuclear engineering. So it's not your mainstream hotel reviews or product catalog or anything like that. It's a complex domain. And you can see all the other metrics here, such as F measure, Levenstein, um, you know, Ribes and Rouge and things like that, all um, line up and they show very clearly that one engine is better than the others by a substantial difference. Now, to create that engine, we had um, industry data, and that's bilingual. So both French, uh, Japanese and Japanese French had just over 20 million sentences of direct industry data. The client only gave us a very small amount of data, 4,500 sentences. So we had to create a lot more data. Now, um, we were able to find bilingual data that was in domain on the internet by crawling and automatically aligning content. Okay. Now, there's not a lot of data out there for the nuclear engineering domain, especially French, Japanese. So that was difficult. So we went to uh, more heavy than normal data synthesis. So um, when we crawled websites and we found um, content, we had matching documents and we had documents that were in the right domain, but not matched. So we used those to help us synthesize and we had different data depending on which direction we were going. So you can see going from French to Japanese, 
we were able to get 34 million sentences, but going Japanese to French, only 18 million. Okay, now the, the Japanese language is a lot more complex to translate into. So even though we had more data, we got a lower blue score. Now, just remember though, blue score is not the master metric here. A 45 in Japanese may be as good as, or even better than a 60 in French. You have to look at each language and have a human evaluate it, but you can compare against other engines quite well using the same. Here's another example. This is a uh, fashion and specifically a subset of fashion, jeans, denim jeans. So this is more mainstream and Google and Bing and Deeple did quite well, but we were able to easily exceed these engines um, with several blue points higher. Now, the customer in this case was able to give us about 280,000 bilingual sentences. Um, we created 18,000 glossary terms. The client could only give us 48. Um, we synthesized nearly 4 million sentences, and we found online another 16 million sentences that we could actually crawl websites, match up the web pages, and download the data and make translation memories. So we created 16 million bilingual sentences that were high quality. And that gave us a total of 41 million sentences that this engine was trained on. Okay, here's another example, a difficult language going from Finnish um, into English in the finance and banking domain. Now this was uh, money laundering and fraud detection specifically. So the customer had zero data they could give us. This was a government, okay? Um, so in our industry domains, we had about 17 million. Um, we created a glossary of 17,000 terms. We synthesized another 8.2 million and we were able to crawl and match and find 15 million to create a total of 54 million sentences. So again, you can see there's quite a sizable difference. Um, so um, in our second version of this engine, after we fine tuned it a little, we got um, 42, nearly 43 blue score, whereas Google, Deeple and Bing were in the low to mid thirties. Okay, so still a substantial difference. Okay, so this is a repeatable process and we can do it over and over in a matter of a couple of weeks, even for these volumes of data. So the first thing we do to achieve this is we understand what the customer is trying to achieve, which language pairs, what document formats, what's their business use case, what's the data inventory they have, what are the KPIs for success, okay, how do they view this? Then we come up with a very simple plan. The only thing the customer has to do is tell us this information and give us any of their existing data. We do everything else. It takes about two weeks to gather the data and two weeks to train an engine. So it's not that big a time, okay? Now, as uh, Philip mentioned earlier, the time to get this data together is very, very quickly collapsing. And very soon we'll be training engines in as little as a few days because we're actually doing what Philip described and that is adding to existing engines in domain data. Okay, those engines are getting prepared now. So we have a clear process of making a project plan. What do we need to synthesize, gather? What do we need to crawl, clean, and delivery deployment? The whole story. So the key technologies to do this is bilingual data manufacturing, so glossary creation and bilingual data mining, data synthesis, such as the uh, Create Roses example and back and reverse translation, um, and advanced data cleaning, analysis, and things like that. And as Philip mentioned, cleaning the data is absolutely essential. So where does all this data come from? So the customer gives us some, we do data manufacturing, we do crawling, aligning, data synthesis, and there's also existing repositories online. So a typical customer engine, especially for the bigger languages today, is anywhere from 50 to 200 million sentences. Okay. We need to prepare that data. So we have automated data cleaning, automated language identification, bulk format conversion between different formats, um, sentence joining and splitting, um, domain classification and similarity analysis, and bulk encoding conversion. Often data is just in the wrong encodings. So cleaning up that encoding and fixing it and getting it right becomes very important. We draw down from our industry domain data, which we have you know, tens or hundreds of millions of sentences of, and depending on the language pair, and we pull out language specific and domain specific content just for your engine. Okay, so we do data matching. We take data that you have, it could be bilingual or it could be monolingual. 
we go and crawl similar data. So maybe you don't have any data, not even monolingual data. We can go and crawl your competitors, maybe a website that's relevant, maybe a regulatory body to get monolingual data that represents what you want. Then we match that against our repository and we can then use that also for data synthesis. Okay, so we do bilingual data mining, um, bilingual document pair matching, um, we classify the data. So is it a formal writing style? Is it um, engineering? Is it marketing? What is it? And we match all the sentences and we build that out together. Now this is 100% automated. Um, glossary creation, we extract glossaries from monolingual data. We use um, alignment technologies to create bilingual glossaries very quickly and efficiently. Sometimes we, the customers want to validate that, but many times we just use automated glossary. It's 100% bilingual um, and it's 100% automated. Okay, so we start with crawling. We take RSS feeds, PDFs, HTML documents. We match the documents automatically. So there might be 10 different languages on a website. If it's a big uh, company, we can pull the entire website down cross-reference using AI all the documents and say, I think this document in French is this document in German, and it's also this document in English. Okay, we can match those up. Then we automatically match all the sentences within the documents. We grade the quality of the translations because not every translation is good. Often there is junk um, that's not suitable, but it could just be fine. Like it might be a menu item, things like that, or it might be the copyright notices. Um, or it might just be a bunch of numbers and dates in a table that just isn't useful to us. So we filter out what's not useful and we tie things together. Now, as we're processing this data today, we're doing things a lot different than we used to. We're processing it to maintain paragraphs and maintain alignments, and we're matching uh, and creating new sentences. So there might be a sentence in Hindi here that didn't exist on the English. So we'll create the English version through data synthesis so that we've got a complete paragraph. And we'll build all of that together so that we can use document mode when we're training. Okay, this is an example from a customer recently. This was the nuclear customer. So in five hours, we managed to download um, 67,820 web pages from the IAEA, that's the International Atomic Energy Agency. Within one hour, we were able to run language ID and separate them. And you can see here the separations. Um, we were then able to process the French against the English, and out of six, 4,614 documents in French, we were able to match all but two of them to an English partner. From that, we were able to extract uh, 2.3 million bilingual sentences, and after cleaning, we were able to remove some noise, and that left us with 1.7 million sentences. Not bad for five hours' work, and not a human anywhere in that process. 100% high quality data that went straight into an engine. Okay, Philip mentioned uh, back and reverse translation. So this is taking data from one language and basically machine translating it to another, but using a whole series of processes to mine it, clean it, extract it, and make sure it's very, very high quality. So we don't want low quality content, and that is a challenge on the very low resource languages. So um, we get far less returns on low resource languages than high resource languages, okay? Um, and we tie all that together, okay? Now, just before I show you a little bit about the upcoming release of Language Studio, I just wanna add a little bit more to what Philip was talking about with multi-language and multi-domain engines. So this is a really interesting engine that we just built a proof of concept for um, one of the um, organizations in Singapore. So it's an odd dialect language, as well as a mixture of many languages. So it's called Singlish or Singapore English. It's a combination of Hindi, Chinese, Malay, Indonesian, Tagalog, English, SMS, and Twitter. So it's a spoken language. It's not really designed to ever be written, but people have started in recent years writing it down when they wanna message each other. So they wanna tweet or they wanna chat about doing things. So these are examples here. Now I've highlighted a few words in the middle here. Um, you can see the abbreviations um, and you can sort of guess it if you were a native English speaker. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Um, the right hand side is the machine translation. So it's actually translated it to pretty good English. 
and now tools can go in and start to process that. Um, but you'll see I'm going to Salmu today is actually a Chinese ceremony um, where um, you go out to your family's uh, ancestors' graves and clean the graves, polish them up, clean them, put a new bunch of flowers, whatever you do there. Um, further down near the bottom, sounds crazy, don't know, can Taho or not? So sounds crazy, I don't know, can tolerate it or not. Okay, so Tahan is a Malay word. So because all of these cultures are mixed together, these words are getting mixed together. So the target language is English, but data mining tools can't process the singlish on its own. It needs another pass to something that is much more understandable. So we used a lot of subtitle data and a lot of informal dialogue data from books and romance novels and all sorts of things like that that we could get our hands on. And we were able to translate this pretty well. Now, another example that we did recently, we were quite surprised. Um, we did tie into English using document mode. And what we were able to do there was something very surprising. First of all, it worked out gender. So in Thai, if a male says thank you, they say kap kun kap. And if a female says thank you, they say kap kun ka. So this was able to work out with a pretty high level of accuracy who was speaking and use the right words for the gender of the person that was speaking. Um, that's a little bit different to what Philip was talking about earlier, which was talking about um, a male or a female nurse or a doctor. This was actually who is speaking the words change. It was also able to work out seniority. So a child will speak different to auntie than an adult speaking to auntie and the vocabulary choice has changed. And that, that actually caught our engineers here off guard. We weren't expecting to see that. So that was something new. So that's some of the benefits of document mode when things tie together. Now, here's another example. This is multi-domain. Um, and what we're doing here in this case, this is a subtitle customer and the language pair was English to Norwegian. Okay, now again, you can see substantial differences between Google and Bing um, compared to our engine because it's finely tuned. But we also had different translation outputs. So what we did was the customer had different writing styles depending on where the content came from. So it was subtitles. So they were subtitling American movies and they were subtitling European movies especially Nordic countries movies. Okay, so we trained with tags. And when we translated, we specified where the content was coming from. And as a result, we got substantially higher translations. Now both um, the Nordic version and the US version of the data was in one engine. And we use the tagging to switch between writing styles with very, very good success. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so Let's look now just for a moment at a sneak preview of Language Studio 6. This is being shipped next month. And I'm just going to go through a couple of the features, a little bit of the architecture and some of the big differences. Okay, so first of all, very fast engine loads. Traditionally, our engines were taking about two minutes to load. Now they're taking between three and 10 seconds. We support document mode translation. And we're in the process of preparing lots of data for different engines for document mode. We'll have a number of them ready to go day one. And then based on customer demand, we'll, we'll pull the others out. Uh, Multi-domain and multi-language engines like I just described, automated language ID and automated domain classification. So as you submit documents, it will able to, it's able to say, hey, this is the uh, US movies. I'm going to set a US flag. Uh, this is the Nordic movies. I'm going to set a Nordic flag. You don't need to manually determine what that is. Or it could be a bigger engine that has life sciences, uh, gaming, uh, you know, finance, politics, and all those kinds of things in there, um, and automatically detect those tags and classify at a point in time, and also able to detect formality and switch based on that information at real time without you having to specify it. That makes a huge difference. Okay, runtime cost. So Philip talked about, can we get away with running on CPU? And the answer is yes. So one of the problems with GPU is it's very expensive to run. If you use GPU and AWS, it's exceptionally expensive. We've got customers that have been spending tens of thousands of dollars a month for relatively low translation volumes, but because they have to use the A100 GPUs, which are incredibly expensive in Amazon. 
Okay, so by switching to CPU at runtime and optimizing the models, we're able to translate between 20,000 and 90,000 words per minute on a single CPU. Now, putting that in real terms, we've been testing with some very optimized models as much as 1,500 words per second. So GPU is still available. However, with the AWS charges, you know, it makes a lot of sense to go for CPU translation. There is only a fraction of the hardware needed. Now, I'm going to add one caveat here. There is a very minor degradation in translation quality, um, but you're talking half a blue point to one blue point, and in some cases, maybe two. But when you're getting blue scores up in the 60s, it doesn't really matter. It's almost indistinguishable. Okay, so it's a performance trade off. Now, if you want to maintain that level of quality and use CPU, you can, but you have to slow down translation a bit. So you might get down to nine or 10,000 words a minute on a CPU if you don't want to have that trade off of, you know, a half or a quarter or one blue point, something like that. Um, we also support auto scaling. And this is something we've just been testing heavily this week. And we've been trying to push it to its limits and we've been very, very happy. We've got a few issues that we're still ironing out, which is why we haven't launched yet. But um, what this means is you could have um, on a weekend, nothing running. So all your resources are automatically shut down. You've just got a database running, a REST API and a job management server that's very small. So it's very cheap to run. And you just, that job management server is watching things and saying, should I scale up or not? Okay, so I get, let's say, a sudden load of data. My customer, um, let's say it's the US Patent Office, um, receives, um, sorry, the Chinese Patent Office uh, downloads, um, you know, 20,000 documents or 50,000 documents. We want them out as fast as possible. So we ramp up. We look at the size of the queue and we can process tens of thousands of documents in an hour. So the test that we've done in the last few days, we were able to ramp up to 250 million words in one hour. So we're very, very pleased with these results. We're still testing, still scaling and still fine tuning. These can handle customer rules based on scaling as well. So the customers can come in and add their own rules. So you can add JavaScript logic to support your rules. So that's very simple, very easy. Um, deployment options. So it can run in our cloud. Um, we have a white label portal, a standard portal that's not white labeled. If you don't want to configure it that way, you can just talk directly to our REST API. We have browser plugins, messenger plugins, office plugins, meeting system plugins, your own application, uh, web portals, hot folders. Um, you can simply just copy files into your folder on the network and suddenly they appear in another language in a different folder. Hot email boxes. We monitor email inboxes. So it can you mail it to an email address like translation at omniscient.com or, or yourdomain.com and a few moments later it will mail you back with the translated document. Um, also for intranet, WordPress, IIS, Apache, and all of these talk to a REST API, which can run in your office as a portal um, on the back end. So they can run for keeping privacy, nothing leaves your office, or they can call our REST API on our back end. You can also have it for overflow. So if you've got a particular capacity and then you have a sudden burst, you can overflow into our API when you have a heavy load. So all of these options are available. Okay. We also have a portable version, so you can even install this on a laptop. Um, this is our scalable architecture. Okay, this is a, a design for AWS, but we have a similar one for Google, uh, Oracle, and several other um, infrastructure platforms. So um, it's load balanced, it's scalable, it's manageable. Um, so we can grow to almost any level you want. We support 99.99% uptime, so very high availability. We can run on clustered databases that replicate to multiple geographic regions, and we can scale with your authentication um, uh, across regions as well. So we have SAML, LDAP, um, and OAuth2 support. Okay, so that's all I've got for today. Um, if there's any questions that you have for either Philip or myself, um, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, Language Studio 6 will be out sometime next month. Um, it'll be the later part of the month. Um, and uh, basically, um, 
you know, it's a scalable platform that is deployed to actually utilize all the things that Philip talked about today. Um, we have a range of off the shelf engines as well that you can just simply start and use. Okay, so we have three questions so far. Um, if you have any more questions, please jump in. I'm gonna start. Um, so um, how do you evaluate the quality of your data, especially from very specialized domains? So Philip, do you wanna go with that one first? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so we, we we worked a lot on um, kind of assessing quality automatically to pick which subsets of the data we should train on. Um, ultimately, um, so all these gives us scores that are relatively meaningless, but they allow us to figure out what is the cleanest subset of the data, what is the still okay, but usable, and which one is a really bad subset of the data. There's various methods um, that consider a language model and so on. Uh, translation dictionaries, uh, semantic representations of words and sentences. Um, ultimately, though, uh, uh, we have to sometimes really decide with experimentation what are the best subsets to use. And we just basically train on different size subsets, and then whatever gives us the best performance. Ultimately, in terms of blue scores of actual translation performance, that's what we go with. Okay, great. Um, I'll just add to that on the domain front. Um, so we do what's uh, called domain similarity analysis, where you can upload a corpora that's in a domain, and we will match against that corpora and extract data that's matching. Okay, um, next question. Uh, where are we? People saying hello. <laughs> okay, hello. Um, so, um, do human translators have a space in this process? There are several areas that humans come in here. Um, we're not here to um, replace human translators. Okay, um, you know, humans will always be able to do things that machines can't, um, the, although those gaps are closing. So Philip showed an example of a bat flying through the air that was able to be detected in the video to complement that. Now, that type of technology is still maturing. But that kind of input is not far away from being able to be used as part of the translation. Um, but humans have knowledge, okay, that a machine will not for a very, very long time. Um, so if you're translating a subtitle, you have context and knowledge that is definitely very different to what the machine has. And so there's definitely a process there. In terms of customizing, there is limited human intervention now. Um, you can validate um, terminology and you can set preferred terminology, writing styles, those kinds of things. And then most of the tools take over and do automated processes from there. So um, it's pretty straightforward there. Um, okay, uh, next question. Uh, I am an English to Spanish translator from Argentina and would like to ask how can I specialize on this? So I'm not sure on terms of specialize on this means. I, if you want to learn how to train engines, that's one thing and we can work with you on that. If you want to learn how to post edit, then um, we can work with you on that. But a lot of language service providers globally are now obviously using machine translation. Um, and there's a lot of courses there. So if you want to become a specialist editor, there is a lot of very good techniques and best practices. Some of our former webinars have that. And if you talk to me after the call, I'll be able to um, address that. Um, here's one for Philip. How is punctuation handled? Um, very simply, we just treat them as other tokens of text usually. Um, what is actually interesting is that um, since uh, one of the byproducts of newer methods is uh, uh, limitations to very small vocabularies, uh, we often also break up words into pieces. And since we have that process in place anyway, we sometimes just do not do any special tokenization at all. We just throw in the raw text and the same methodology that separates out big complicated compound words into smaller pieces or rare words into smaller pieces also separates our punctuation. Um, so a lot of these things are now, yeah, just we trust the neural model to, to handle this. Um, having said that, uh, it becomes much more an issue when you don't have as much data to, to handle these things right. Um, punctuation also has issues like uh, what Unicode characters you use to represent it, and uh, there might be discrepancy between the actual 
runtime deployment, the training data, and you need to clean that up uh, a bit. So it's a it's uh, it, it easily becomes a very messy uh, problem. Okay, great. So there's a couple of very good questions that have just come in. So um, first one is for me. Um, how do you ensure terminology consistency on in-domain engines? Um, so there's two parts there. Um, one is what Philip talked about earlier, where he used the example of tables spanning multiple sentences. Um, but the other is you can actually guide the engine to what you want it to translate. So today, for example, with one of our customers, uh, they gave us a glossary recently and the engine had already been trained. Now, um, they liked the translations, but they didn't like some of the vocabulary of choice. They wanted very specific terminology in a fashion domain. So um, what we did was we matched all of our training data that had the, um, the English, uh, uh, sorry, the Dutch side um, of terminology. We extracted all the bilingual sentences. We then um, used uh, what's called word alignment to find out what vocabulary was matching in the original. And we made sure that it was the customer's preferred vocabulary. And then we did an incremental training that Philip talked about earlier that added a bias to the engine. And as a result, the terminology now comes out locked into the customer's preferences. Okay, so that made a big difference. Um, we have- yeah, maybe, um, maybe I can follow up to that. Uh, so yeah, terminology is, uh, we had a really good solution for it in statistically MT days. And we pretty much was not big a big problem for us. Um, but yeah, with newer methods, you have so much less control over what it's producing. So we had to really work hard to come up with uh, workable solutions that place the words the way we want in the output in the right place, uh, while not leading otherwise to degradation of translation quality. But we made much progress on that. And uh, this is still a kind of an interesting uh, subfield. Okay. Great, that's a very valid point. Um, yeah, we, I mean, Philip, you and I have been talking about adding glossaries and trying to push them and it's still not a 100% solved problem, but we can certainly add a lot of influence and bias now compared to before. Um, okay, so um, from one of our Singapore customers, um, how do you perform document translation for character-based languages such as Thai, which do not have clear breaks in between sentences? Do you want to have a go at that first, Philip, and then I'll have a go? That's yeah, a tough um, one. So, yeah, so this is, uh, yeah, so there's Chinese, Thai, uh, various other languages uh, which don't make spaces between words. Thai is even worse, they don't even make spaces between sentences. Um, so the traditional method to that is to have additional processing step called segmentation that breaks that up into spaces. And that is by and large still the best thing to do. Uh, what I described earlier that there's a um, there's a pre-processing step where we break up uh, maybe even big words into smaller words. This can also handle uh, languages that don't have space separation, but in general, uh, if you're smart about it, you do better than just trust that methodology for this particular problem. Right, so um, I'll just add to that as well. Um, you know, Thai is, is tricky. So um, they really have paragraphs, not sentences. Um, but um, document mode is actually uh, working very well going Thai into English because it just sees it as a much longer sentence and it handles that quite nicely. Um, what we have to do afterwards sometimes is actually look at the English sentences that come out, which are very long, which are much more like uh, run on sentences and then add some punctuation. In. So a little bit like voice recognition processing where there's no end of sentence boundaries, try and detect where there should be sentence boundaries in the middle of the paragraph and remove the and thens and thens and so on um, so that it's structured better for English. Okay, um, then we have um, another question. Uh, how much additional data is needed in order to make a noticeable gain in translation quality considering how existing models could be trained on millions or billions of sentences? So very good question. Do you want to go first, Philip? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a bit hard to kind of come up with the hard and fast numbers, but I mean, you need to look at the relationship between how much data you have originally and how much data you uh, have to add that is now on the right domain, clean, uh, well-prepared. Um, 
I mean, I would now just guess how much data you need, but it's clearly in the millions of words. Right. So I'm going to add to that the context of one of our previous slides where you would have noticed that we had percentages of training data. So we're actually very focused on how much data is in domain. OK, um, we want to make sure that there's a substantial portion, um, typically at least 30 percent is what we're aiming for. Um, now, that may change if you have a huge engine where you're getting billions of sentences, which is not out of the question in the coming uh, years, um, and we're heading towards that. Um, but, um, you know, what we're trying to do now for customers is add uh, around 10 to 20 million sentences of in-domain content. And, you know, often that's not available, so we have to synthesize, um, back translate, and do other versions of data to get that in. Okay. Um, so there's a couple of people asking about um, the costs of Language Studio. Um, I won't go into that on the call, um, but um, I will contact those people um, who are asking and after the call, and we can talk about their specific case because there's different scenarios for what you need. Um, another question is, um, could it improve MT quality, example, Blue Score, to pre-process the parallel corpora by conducting an explicit word sense disambiguation? So Philip. Um, I'm not sure exactly how to address this. Um, in a way, I mean, what the neural models do, they have a word uh, sense disambiguation stage. I mean, that's something that happens in the encoder. So uh, is the idea now that you have uh, a kind of a much more trusted or better method to do word sense disambiguation uh, that you kind of have at hand. Um, obviously, a lot of the automatically trained methods will work very similar to what neural machine translation models are already doing. But if you do have that, yes, uh, it's relatively straightforward then to use that um, to just kind of label the different instances of a word with slightly different tokens, you know, table one, table two instead of table, and then use it that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, the general experience is that this is a very broad problem. There are some words that have very, very clear different meanings, like the bat example, like yeah, the animal and the, and the sports instrument are uh, drastically different things. But um, what we notice much more, there's a lot of words that kind of have more subtle different meanings and they just kind of mean slightly different things in different contexts. And that is actually much more important uh, or much more prevalent and uh, yeah, even defining what the word senses are is not straightforward. So yes, word senses integration has been long, for a long, long time, a kind of a really big, important field, the problem in, in natural language processing. Uh, we really uh, kind of address it nowadays in machine translation, kind of holistically with the rest of the uh, problems in machine translation. Okay, great. Um, here's a good one, and I'll take a stab first at answering this one, and maybe you can add to it, Philip. So what value blue score would you consider okay in order to get uh, publishable content with post editing? So um, there's no one number is the answer. Um, first of all, it depends on the domain and on the language pair. So the example I gave earlier of a 45 in Japanese may actually be in real world terms better than a 60 in French. So it's language pair specific, it's domain specific and it's actually content specific. So there's no one score that you could say, but um, I would say in general for the mainstream Romanized languages, um, you, you know, you're, you're looking at anywhere above 40 is useful. And for some of the Asian languages like Chinese, maybe above 30 at least, something like that, 25 to 30. Yeah, uh, let me add like one one twist to that, since this is such a common question, uh, just because I had like these numbers on my head. Uh, so we have a big competition actually happening right now on news translation. And if you, these are kind of the biggest labs in the world building systems that are computationally totally excessive. And the blue scores we're seeing there are in the 30s. And that is because it's news. There's just so many different ways how you can translate a sentence and use this. You know, you can rephrase it, make it a bit more idiomatic, make it a bit more fluent, write it this way, write it that way. Um, so these are blue scores in the 30s, maybe. Um, another example is where we build models on legal text. 
And uh, even with much less data and not very sophisticated models already 10, 20 years ago, you saw blue scores in the 60s and 70s because legal text, that's just one way to write it. So matching the human reference is much easier there. So uh, does that mean these legal translations were better than the news translation? Not, not really, it's just that, you know, since blue score works by comparing against the reference translation, and if there's only one way to translate, you're just gonna by the nature of it get higher blue scores than in news, where there's so many different ways you can say the same thing. Right, and I, I'd just add to that too, I mean, there's a lot of other metrics that you can look at. Um, so one of the questions here is what, what are some of the other metrics and how do you use them and so on. So um, for example, RIBES here is very good for, it was designed for Japanese originally, um, to handle better metrics for long distance reordering. Um, but one thing that's been noted with neural machine translation is it often scores a blue score lower than um, statistical machine translation, but when a human reviews it, they actually rate it better. So, you know, you can't just trust the scores on their own. Um, you know, that they do have differences there. Um, Okay, there are a couple more questions, but um, unfortunately we're at our 90 minute mark, um, but I will try and uh, touch base with the people who ask those questions after the call and uh, give them some feedback. If you do have any further questions, please don't hesitate to uh, mail us. You can mail us at uh, sales at omniscient.com. Um, I'm not trying to sell you anything, but that's just the email address that we can uh, use to get an answer. Um, and uh, I will come back to you, um, or Philip will come back to you with a direct answer. Okay, so thank you for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate your attendance. Um, stay tuned for uh, Language Studio version six next month. Um, there'll be some big announcements there and we'll be able to demonstrate it live and show you many other features that are, we're gonna be announcing uh, in the month of July. Thank you very much. Uh, hope to see you again on a future webinar. Have a great day, bye-bye.